Hello, and welcome to Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Friday, January 14th, 2022. I'm Maggie Lake here with Real Vision co-founder Ralph Powell. Ralph, it's great to see you, and it's been nonstop, right? You've done like what a half a dozen interviews in the I, past I know. few days. Coming and I don't know into how, this hot. And I don't know how it's Friday. It should be Wednesday, as far as I was. It's like Friday. No, it can't be. <laughs> but now I've got to the Friday afternoon. I'm kind of ready for the weekend. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people are probably saying, thank God it's Friday, because it's been a really sort of volatile feeling beginning of the year, kind of intense uh, market week with a lot of information. This is the first time we're actually doing the daily briefing together this year. So, well, we did what, it live. We did it live in yes, uh, Vegas. Yes. Um, but what, what do you make of the market action so far? I mean, where's your head? So my head is the market is still thrashing around with, oh, my God, look at the inflation numbers versus some underlying changes going on. So there's rotations going on, which makes everything feel super choppy. There's a, every bear is shouting, oh, my God, the Fed are going to raise rates. Everything's going to crash. There's the deflationists who I would count myself into that camp saying, well, the, the, the world won't take higher rates. And if you raise the rate of inflation higher, faster than the, uh, the wages, you're going to see consumption fall. So there's this battle going on in the markets right now and in narratives. And obviously, the inflation narrative has, been, has taken hold. But I'm starting to see forward-looking indicators suggesting that it's not going to stick. Uh, and that's contentious in itself. So everyone wants to throw poo at each other over Twitter, even suggesting that, that that's happening. But that's, that's the world <laughs> we live in. It's, it's so true. This is a time when there's very little consensus. It's confusing for people. Yes, it is. And that's usually what happens when you're at the end of a particular market regime. So, you know, you're starting to see the two different narratives fighting for control. And it feels like that's the situation we're in. doesn't mean it happens overnight. You know, I think market volatility is the outcome for a while longer mm -hmm. until people get comfortable with, okay, what is happening? Now, it's pretty straightforward to me is if the bond market, if we look at the yield curve, it's flattening. If that breaks those recent lows, it's telling us the Fed cannot raise um, significantly more or even the four times that they're talking about. So then we will start to see 10-year bond yields peaking out. That would be at the top of that long-term trend, the chart of truth, as I call it, which is the 30-year channel um, of bond yield. About 2% is the top of that channel. Sometimes at the peak of the cycle, it goes to a little bit through, 25 basis points through. So somewhere around then, you'd start to see the reversion. We're starting to see the ISM, ISM new orders, the ECRI. We're starting to see retail sales today. Mm -hmm. All sorts of indicators saying uh, the Atlanta Fed came and revised down growth this morning in their um, Fed Now model. So I think that the macro shift that's underway and we've seen it as commodities stopped going up really some commodities have rebound but it's been less clear the inflation trade is less clear in the markets any longer and we've got this value growth rotation um the the kind of core kind of tech super long names are still getting smashed mm. but as soon as the bond market turns around they'll turn around too so, so th this is really important, and this is why you watch the bond market, because you think that that's leading, right? Some of what we're seeing in this rotation is um, maybe paying more attention, or is the tail, paying more attention to so, some of the lagging. So if you're a bond trader, your entire job is to analyze inflation and GDP growth. That's it. If you're an equity trader, you're trading sentiments, you're trading earnings, you're trading buybacks, you're trading all sorts of things. Bond traders do two things, inflation, GDP growth, which is why they tend to be right, because that's what they get paid to do, is look at two things only. Um, so over time, very rare the bond market's wrong. 1994 was the only time in my entire career the bond market's been really wrong about things. So um, I always pay attention to the bond market because I call it, you know, the bond market is the truth. It's, the, in, the inflation debate is very interesting, isn't it? And, and I have to say, we, we, we are so fortunate to have so many sort of really smart minds, market watchers, a lot of experienced guests coming through the programs on Real Vision. And you've noticed 
a lot of them sort of saying what you're saying, that I think it's peaking. I think inflation's peaking. What about the other side of that argument when people say, look at wages? And look at things like housing and rent. Those are, you know, you lock in for the year, and that isn't even ha started to uh, hit the inflation print. They're all lagged, for starters, because mm -hmm. it's the slowest, hardest thing to do. Secondly, look at wage inflation and think, is, is net incremental demand in the economy going up? Well, wage inflation is less than inflation, so we've got negative real wages. Secondly, there are more people la leaving the labor force than ever before. The labor force participation rate is super low. Many of those are baby boomers who have high incomes and high earning power. So you're offsetting millennials, giving them an increase. They earn a lot less than they are leaving. So net-net, you've probably got a fall in total demand. And you're seeing it in the numbers already, I believe, which was the um, retail sales numbers that came. Partly it's Omicron. Omicron it's not clear yet. But my, my view is that, that we're actually lowering the trend rate of growth, but people can't see it because we're still dealing with the machinations after, after the pandemic. Yeah. What do you think this means for the Fed then? So my view, and it has been all year, and I've been looking at this whole junction all year because I think it's the bigger trade, is I think the Fed are not going to deliver what they say. Every, I looked at every recession going back to 1963, and almost every single time there is a growth scare early on because the economy is not fully stabilized yet. Mm. So what happens is stimulus comes out of the economy, fiscal stimulus. The Fed starts talking about tightening because, because uh, inflation's risen, because the year-on-year -year rates have changed and stuff like that. This time we've got supply issues. And then what happens is the Fed think about raising, and before you know it, growth evaporates again. And then the Fed actually end up cutting. So I think we will get a couple of rate rises in potentially maybe only one uh, that's my view why well, because i think by june i think inflation is back down to three percent and and the ism is probably closer to 52 than it is to 60. so you don't want to tighten into a falling economy going into a election i know the narrative now is well they need to tighten to look like they're fighting inflation best thing to do is talk tough get a rate hike in maybe two two 25 basis points in, then let the, la the natural kind of ebbing and flowing of the economy work in your favor. You can say, we've beaten inflation, um, and then you can get a stimulus package through. Yeah, take a, take a victory lap. <laughs> we then, phoned it before we had to actually do. And then stimulate ahead of the election. I mean, that would be, that would be perfect for them. So the, the reason I dropped, my jaw dropped, obviously, we've all seen the headlines, right? You have so many, the market pricing in at least four, not only interest rate so, hikes, but lots so of here, talk about quantitative tightening. This is so aggressive. Here, yeah. So here's the fact is I saw it yesterday, and I've been following this for two decades now. Every single year of my entire career, every single investment bank has predicted rates too high. Without question, a hundred percent forecast error, <laughs> and they do it all the time because they seem to ignore the fact that we're in a secular downtrend driven by demographics, with a massive credit um, a credit bubble. So you can't raise rates. I mean, you can't generate inflation, and you can't raise rates. But they ignore it every time, and every time. I remember last time we hit the chart of truth line which was back in 2018, the last time I was starting to comment about, I think this dynamic's changing. Jeff Gunn likes like it's breaking the chart of truth. It's going to 6%. The, you know, the world's going to fall apart. I've heard this every three years of my career, and it never happens. Now, is this time different? There's always a probability, mm. but it's not the highest probability to me. So Robert, uh, who put a question to the RV site, that answered his question. Are they going to raise rate four times? Is this even possible without creating, uh, cratering the economy? Raul just answered that. We, we do have, so what does this mean for risk assets? We do have people asking about what about this, you know, sell-off we've seen in tech. Given that outlook, uh, that you don't expect that action from the Fed, does this, does this sort of so, give you any indication of so how risk assets So what makes long-duration assets? less attractive is not increasing bond yields it's the inflation that we've had so you discount it by the inflation so if the market is wrong in expecting higher inflation for longer then growth stocks will explode higher again 
selling physical products is not the best way of making money on Amazon in 2021. Now, yes, that model does. Because really, let's face it, we live in an exponential age. Anybody who thinks that tech stocks, high growth, long duration tech stocks that are capturing exponential rise of technology are not going to go up again. That can't happen just because of network effects of what's going on. We're not talking about IBM here or GE stock or some of these things can trade sideways for decades, but you can't trade sideways for decades when you've got exponential growth going on. It just, it just can't happen. Now, you can have periods of a year, 18 months of sideways down markets, which we've been seeing, but then what happens is they end up looking ludicrously cheap um, versus what's happening. And the moment the inflation story disappears, then everyone piles into growth again. So th that leads us, uh, Eric, asking a second part of his question from the exchange, what about crypto? Crypto is similar to growth. It's driven by its own network models and adoption. There's a bunch of other stuff. But similar to that, I, I said crypto had been trading sideways because um, wage growth has not kept up with inflation, so marginal, um, marginal dollars to invest by retail has been reduced. Um, and I think that it gets partly caught up in the growth story, but there's no correlation really between bonds and crypto, the dollar mm -hmm. and crypto. They're all passing correlations that come in and out. You know, suddenly the S&P is correlated for a bit, and then it's not. So I don't worry about that. I just look at the network effects over time. But if the Fed increases the size of the balance sheet, then it's all correlated because you're lowering the value of the denominator. So that's why when the Fed increase the balance sheet, what you find is that everything goes up. Now, does it happen when the Fed decrease the balance sheet? Are they going to shrink the balance sheet? And does that crash the market? If they do do it, markets will stop going up as much because of the fact that you're increasing the value of the denominator. Mm. So it changes that. So, so yes, we saw it last time around. There was a period of time as the Fed were reducing the size of the balance sheet. No, they kept the balance sheet stable. Stocks were sideways for a while. But then even with a stable balance sheet, stocks took off again because the growth story is still underlying. Um, what the market won't like is raising rates. It took eight times before the market cracked last time. So it never happens on the first couple of goes. The market has a wobble, but then it shakes it off. Um, so it took eight times last time, and it took the balance sheet taper. And then the market started rolling over. So... So you feel like sideways. You and Julian Bridgeton had a, of MIT had, uh, just filmed your latest Macro Insider conversation, and Julian seemed a lot more concerned about the risks around that change. And so <laughs> Julian's from the silver market. His modus operandi, everything in his body is about inflation <laughs> and the Fed are going to take your precious metals away. So, you know, and then, to be fair, he, he nailed the inflation call this year. You know, mm. I was more sanguine. I didn't really get involved, but he, he really saw it coming. So... We have that argument because I'm a dyed-in-the-wool deflationist. He's a dyed-in-the-wool inflationist. Well, that's why the conversations are so good. And, and you, were, you were very kind to him entertaining his, his concerns about that. Um, but, but I, you know, I can't – see, the issue I have with this is, okay, so we've got inflation. What happens? You raise rates. What happens? Market eventually slows down. The economy slows down. Eventually, the stock market goes down. And eventually, the Fed come back in because they can't allow the collateral of the market, the equity market, the bond market, whatever, to fall apart. So then they stimulate again. So I'm like, well, it's kind of a never-ending cycle of even if it comes off, it stimulates. So I'm not worried by it, really, I guess. And you're not worried that inflation stays high enough that it prevents them from sort of looking after the asset market. Some people that, think they want to take steam out of the asset market. I don't think they do. Um, I think, um, look, that's the risk to my view is that I'm wrong. And growth itself, let's say, later in 20, back end of 2022, is stronger than I expect, and inflation persists at three and a half, four percent. Yeah, that I would be wrong. And if that was the case, then we're going to see a more prolonged bear market in these higher growth tech names, bond yields. I don't think bond yields would move a lot on that, but we get more of this market rotation in the equity market, stuff like that. We, we have a question from JB on the exchange. Uh, w w since we're talking about, you know, the potential for all of the tech stocks once again to, to take off, what's your opinion of ARK and Kathy Wood? 
So I'm, it, it staggers me that people get emotional about somebody else's portfolio. And people get emotional about Kathy Wood. They don't like it. Why? Because it's all about change. It's all about, you know, non-traditional valuation metrics using things like Metcalfe's Law. They don't like it. I really respect Kathy's view. And yes, she's dealing with this massive rotation out of the names that she owns. It's normal. I have a log chart I have of ARC that I use, look at all the time, a, uh, a monthly log chart. It's about two standard deviations oversold in the, in the trend channel. Most likely, we're at the lower end of the range. $70 is two standard deviations. We hit 78 today. Does it break it? False break? Go higher? Probably. So I am getting very interested in accumulating. I've been talking about this trade for a long time, been waiting for this to set up, letting the inflation narrative get bigger and bigger and bigger, let people throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is the network growth stocks that you absolutely want to own for the next 10 years. We're getting a, an incredible entry point, I think. Now, I understand people think there's technical diff difficulties because she ends up selling liquid stocks to fund the mm -hmm. illiquid stock. I get that. Let's see how it plays out. I get there's a risk. That's okay. Markets have risks. And we're all adults, and we decide what risk we'll take and what risk we won't take. I'll probably take that risk. You know, entry point is really important, isn't it? Because, you know, we, we've seen a lot of concern and a lot of angst over the decline we saw in crypto from the November highs. So if you bought at that time, it's been incredibly painful and stressful for people. Um, but I, but I, I, in your note, in your, in your uh, GMI note to your investors, your think piece in January, you kind of reminded everyone what the gains were in, in Bitcoin and ETH uh, last year. I think it's worth reiterating that, right? It depends when you get in. That's right. I mean, you know, last year I had one of the best years I've ever had. And Ethereum, which was my biggest bet, was up 450%. And Bitcoin was a smaller bet, and, I was up, and that was up 60%. And a whole bunch of stuff was up hundreds of percent. And that's not to boast about me. It was, to, it was about sticking with the plan that I had, and I got the right timing to get in at the right time. So if you remember at the time, I'm a macro guy. I wait for the buses to turn up. I don't try and, you know... Um, I don't try to find every trade. I'm not interested in that. I'm not a short-term guy. So I wait and wait and wait. And I waited for that crypto opportunity. I'd been saying for maybe two years, three years, that crypto and macro are about to meet, and it's going to meet at the next recession. The Fed are going to have to print massively, and this is the time to buy. And I went all in. And I've been talking about the exponential age for an extended period of time now, saying, listen, this is the big trade. The big equity trade here is the exponential age which are all of these network adoption models of modern technology so here we are setting up exactly the right trade which is stuff like arc or um, scottish mortgage all of these things they're all coming to the entry point get the entry point right at the maximum point of fear when everybody says this is terrible that's the point you can drive extraordinary returns if you're a long-term holder I'm not a trader, so I don't really care about the next three months. If I buy ARC, if, I'm expecting to hold it for five to ten years. And if I get it right, it'll go up 10x. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that's so important because there have been a lot of sort of existential questions in this decline by, by skeptics. You know, who will say this is proof it's not working and, and there has to be a more nuanced conversation. I, I want to I circle back to crypto in a minute, but I want to talk about another trade.